Okay, well, as um, Anne said, um, my project's all about blogs, so I'm only looking at one particular type of social media, but obviously blogs quite often act as a nexus to that, so it sort of fits in with sort of Twitter and so forth and joins out. Um, I was basically introduced to blogs about three, just over three years ago, um, when I was started working for the IHR and Institute of Historical Research. Um, at, then it was the um, History Spot blog, which I was setting up, which was basically the project I was going to work on was to upload podcasts for the research seminars that the IHR do, as well as sort of online training materials. So I was asked to create a blog, um, told probably to, to use WordPress, and to focus on the day-to-day -day life of a project officer, um, but which was all well and good, but I just didn't really know what to expect from blogs. I've never used one before, never really visited them even. Um, so this is the History Spot blog. It hasn't actually changed that much over the years, but there are a few changes which um, hopefully make it slightly better, but I probably do need to do more revamping. But there's a few issues on it which remain to this day because of the early lack of knowledge that I actually had on what blogs were about. Um, for example, the original title was IHR Digital Seminars and Research Training Blog. Um, not exactly catchy. Um, it does say what it, what's what's in the tin, I suppose, but that's about it. So there was no real proper title there, no no name to go with. Um, secondly, the URL was ihrprojects at um, dot wordpress dot com, which again doesn't really tell you anything. Admittedly, we didn't have the history spot name at the time. Um, we came up with that later, but. Those are two issues that stick with the blog and are very difficult to get rid of entirely. So that was my first introduction to blogs. Since then I've done quite a few different ones and hopefully improved on what I do with those. Um, but as a mini case study to begin with, that's some of the issues that I sort of first came across really. Um, so when I came to writing this paper, um, I found that I was actually beginning to sound quite down on um, the idea of blogging, so I wanted to avoid actually going down that route too much. But I've been listening to quite a few comments that people have been making at workshops, conferences, just and just generally, and quite a few of the same things were coming out all the time. Um, some were saying there just isn't enough time in the day to write blog posts as well as do my research, and that is a real issue. Um, I struggled to figure out what actually to write on a blog, or what's, what's the point of it all. Um, I feel I ought to do it just because everyone's doing it these days. I'm sort of told that it's the way to go. So these are some of the issues that are coming through. Um, a couple of days ago, uh, Monday actually, that I followed on a Twitter feed that some that a postgraduate blogger had um, believed that their work had been stolen by a national newspaper um, that they put on a blog post. Um, their initial reaction was to delete the blog or delete the um, posts, but somebody else was on Twitter saying, no, don't do this. This is your proof. This is... This, your research is there with a date stamp on it. Um, but p the fear of plagiarism, that's another issue that quite often creeps up as well. So there are quite a few issues with blogs which people come up with. And I think my project, what I wanted my project to be about was to find out, not necessarily if these, actually, if these worries are true or not, but to give a bit of guidance on what blogging is about, what you can get out of it as well as the pitfalls and dangers, but not to overemphasize those, because generally, like we were talking about yesterday, they're not as big an issue generally as they often seem to be. Quite often, they're, they're more of a worry than an actual real problem. Um, so when I saw the advert for the SMKE project, um, I realized that this is a perfect opportunity to actually deal with my own sort of uncertainties, my own, own confusion about blogs, and to think a bit more about what they are, what they mean, and what I can get out of them, as well as what other people can. Um, so this is the Blogging for Historians blog, um, some of you may have already seen it. Um, I, I actually went with a fairly straightforward blogging um, design, but one that um, cuts down the sides of the blog posts on the front page, so it kind of get, gives it a bit of a different kind of index. Um, what was the project actually doing? Well. First of all, there was the blog, so I was setting up a blog, I'd do some posts about blogging on there, but the primary output was six podcasted interviews with people who were already blogging in academia as well as the archives and library sector. So I wanted to see what other people are doing, get some ideas of why they're blogging, what they're doing, how they're doing it, how they're managing it, and um, what ideas they actually have about best practice. Secondly, um, I was to do an online survey or questionnaire um, that was 
basically to give me a bit more um, sort of research evidence and a bit of information about what people thought about blogging again and do they have do these people have blogs what do they think of it how many blogs do they post on and then finally a toolkit or a guide to blogging developed especially for historians and early career um, researchers so I wanted to sort of create something at the end which took all of this information and joined it together Um, one thing I was quite keen to do with the interviews especially was to make sure that they were on divergent types of blogs so that they weren't the same type of things. So here's a rough list of the kind of blogs that I see researchers especially but also people working in other sectors related to history, the type of things that they use blogs for. Um, so a research blog, obviously um, talking about your own personal research, point of view blog, discussing more about your experiences as a lecturer or whatever job that you're actually in, sort of in the museum's archives and so forth. Um, then there's the shared blogging, um, an institution shared blogging, so it's there to promote a department, give staff members a, a joint forum to discuss, debate, um, post up their research and so forth. Then a slightly different version, a scholarly shared blog, um, and this one is basically around a specific theme or topic. Um, between a small group of academics usually, so there might be sort of five to ten people all interested in the same um, area of um, history and they will do this blog together. They don't necessarily need to be at the same institution, they can be anywhere in the world potentially. Um, then there's the events blog, designed to advertise and talk about an event, like a workshop or conference. And a project blog, um, which is often set up for um, projects from funding bodies, but can be set up for almost any kind of project. So they were, they're the general sort of types of history blogs that I sort of noted relating to sort of academia and the archives library sector. Um, these are the types of, um, or these are the people that I interviewed. So first of all, you've got those from the archives and library. So I had Ruth Ford from the National Archives blog and Margaret Makepeace and Penny Brook who managed the Untold Lives blog at um, the British Library. Then for individual research blogs, I talked to Tim Hitchcock about um, his histrionics blog. Then the collaborative research blogs, I'd say there's two different types that I've got here. So the Russian history blog is between scholars in various different places, mainly in the US actually, but the person I talked to was in Sheffield. And then the History Matters blog, which again in Sheffield, but it's the departmental blog. So this is their history department's blog, and they've done something with that which actually allows them to talk about history in a quite um, constructive way whilst also giving all the staff members a way into actually taking part. Finally, I went for something that was very different, which was a blog aggregator. Um, this is basically, it's not a blog, but it basically aggregates all the posts or all these different blogs together. In this case, the Early Modern Commons, which basically um, puts about 260 different blogs at the moment, of all about early modern um, research it, as a list, a sort of an index, but also aggregates the posts from them all. So there's a rolling blog roll of all the different posts. So I wanted to know a bit more about that project and how that may feed into everything. Okay, so now I'm just going to quickly go through um, some of the things that came out in the interviews. And they're all on the blog, all online. So if you wanted to have a look, they're about 20 to 30 minutes each. Um, but I'll talk a bit more about that a bit later. Okay, so first of all, the National Archives blog. Um, why, I asked them why it was set up. Um, part, it was part of a larger social media policy, um, which most places have these days, of some sort or another. Um, their main goal was for transparency and openness, but also to attempt a human touch to the archives. Um, because they are civil servants, they work in a sort of quite strict set of guidelines which limit their sort of public output um, in a sense that, that they've got to sort of talk as a, as a we, as a collective, rather than as an I, as themselves. So the blog allowed them to almost let down their hair to talk about their, what they're interested in, what they find in their own archives and their own um, departments within that, and allows them to have a bit of fun whilst not straying too far from that remit. Um, I also asked them how the blog is managed. Um, the long it, there's a long-term plan put in place, and there's a lot of thinking and discussion about it beforehand. 
um, they wanted to ensure that the content continues. That was their main concern. And this came out a lot, actually, that they were very concerned that the content would just dry up after a few months, that people would lose interest after sort of initial sort of excitement. So they wanted to make sure that staff members kept being interested into it. Um, in this case, they actually asked the staff to sort of sign up for a six month period minimum. Um, so they, they wouldn't have to do too many blogs within that period, um, blog posts in that period, but they wanted to make sure that they took part for a, a significant length of time. Um, in each case, posts were scheduled for about one month in advance and there's about three to four posts put, being put up a week. So there is actually quite a lot of content going, sort of rolling through this blog. Going on to the Untold Lives blog at the British Library, um, I talked to Margaret Makepeace and Penny Brook. And in this case, unlike the National Archives, who only just have the one main blog for the whole of the archives, British Library have quite a few different blogs um, that they index on one page on their website. So this was just one of those, one of the amongst many blogs. Um, the initial, that meant that the initial considerations that the um, TNA actually had to deal with weren't quite relevant because that had already been done. Um, but they also did have to consider sort of what subject they were doing. Would it be um, flexible enough to allow all the staff members in that department to actually take place if, part if they wanted to? Um, but whilst actually keeping it as a, as a manageable topic, something that people can actually understand, this is what this blog is about, this, this is what the Untold Lives blog is. Um, again, they shared the goal for transparency and openness. They were interested in, in emphasising human voice and they emphasised as well that it's a storytelling process for them. So they wanted to tell stories from their, um, from their objects that they actually have, their books or sort of manuscripts and so forth. Um, they had to go through an approval process and they required it to be sort of flexible. Um, the blog was managed by two editors that added the gatekeepers, and this was, um, this was Margaret and um, Penny. In exactly the same way as the TNA, there was somebody basically in charge to upload the blogs, to put them online, to schedule them. So all the staff members had to actually do was write the post in the initial, um, in its initial form, presumably in a Word document or something like that. Um, schedules were also kept up, but in this case they emphasised that they um, inserted key dates in the year so that whenever anything important came up or sort of historically relevant, they could try to make sure that there's a post available that would fit roughly into that. So they, they had a plan there, basically, um, on how they were going to go about this. And um, again, they had backup posts as well, so five to ten posts just waiting there for whenever um, they might need it. I think at the time they had a post about an elephant or something like that ready to go at any moment, um, which I, I think they were quite excited about, um, but I haven't actually checked to see if that's gone up. Um, Okay, moving on to a similar type of blog, um, the History Matters blog, but this time this is Department of History at the University of Sheffield. So it's the same idea, um, it's about promoting the work that they're doing to a, a wider audience, but this time it's actually at, in academia rather than the archives and library sector. Um, so the main reason why it's set up was to raise the profile of the department's research and to give them a, a bit of more um, sort of of a digital presence as well, so that they're online a bit more visibly. Um, they wanted to engage with a wider audience and demonstrate the relevance of academic history in today's world. Um, so this is w the theme that they came up with. Um, they wanted a theme which represented the department in all its many diverse sort of ways, because you've got medievalists, early modernists, modernists, cultural, political historians, all sorts of things there. But they wanted something that would actually fit everyone, so everyone can take part but also that's fitting into a nice, neat topic. Um, in this case, sort of the relevance of history, basically, um, why history matters. Um, again, they had a schedule um, maintained with important events, so, and they do definitely sort of follow this. Whenever there's an important event, there are posts about it. Um, when the new pope was, it, um, or when the pope resigned and the new pope came in, there was quite a few po um, to um, posts about um, pontiffs who had resigned in the past and so forth, um, just as an example. Uh, so they tried to make sure that they remain relevant to actual current topics. Um, it, it's an entirely voluntary thing for the staff. Um, some will take part quite regularly, others just the occasional blog post every now and then, but they do sort of 
push people to a certain extent whenever, you know, if there's something of relevance going on, they will push that person to that's knows about that in their department to try to do a blog post. But it is all voluntary at the end of the day. Um, so in all three of these, they're all about promotion of the department or um, the archive and library. So that's their sort of main mandate, if you like. Um, as a comparison, the Russian history blog um, is between various academics, mainly in the US, but um, one or two in the UK. And their reasons were actually very, very different for setting up, and their approach to it was very different as well. So it's still a collaborative blog, still a shared blog, but the point behind it was quite different. Um, it initially came up because of the frustration with book reviews. Um, by the time a book review came out, it was almost irrelevant. It didn't really matter anymore because the book had been consumed by everyone that was interested in it anyway. So they wanted a place where they can actually talk almost immediately about that book and potentially um, bring in the author to that discussion and actually start up a discussion about sort of the goods, the bads and so forth. And this seems to have been quite um, um, a popular and well done sort of thing. Um, they've got quite a few comments on their blog. They do get these debates going, um, which isn't usually the case on most of these. Um, they also wanted from this blog a means to maintain an online presence without the additional pressure of regular posting. And um, so we come back to the time factor, the problem with that. So there's about 10 people that collaborate on this. And basically when you've got that many people, you only need to post a couple of blog posts a year to actually be part of that and you still got that presence there. So it's a way of actually making it a bit more manageable. Um, it also has acted as a focus for the discussion around the subject matter. It's actually influenced their research. And it's also been good for networking. Um, Miriam Dobson, who I talked to, said that she'd actually been recognised as one of the Russian history bloggers. So she's been attached, sort of seemed to be attached to this and um, I think she was actually invited to give a paper on that basis as well. Um, in this case, it was a much more informal managing system. Um, there's one person in charge, um, and, but all they really were doing was prodding people when nothing had gone up for a while. So it was a little bit more relaxed. Things would go up when they're ready. There's no particular schedule or concern about getting things that are relevant to what's going on in the world today um, up at the specific times. Um, each contributor was allowed to upload their posts by themselves, so there's no sort of process there. Um, so it's a lot more informal, more relaxed in that respect, but I think that was, um, reflects the fact that their purpose was very different. Okay, um, a personal research blog, I talked to Tim Hitchcock, which um, he's a um, digital human, um, works in digital history, mainly sort of, um, behind Old Bailey proceedings. Um, I asked him why he set it up, and it was basically just an experiment um, to see, see if they were useful. He did this quite a few years ago. Um, he said he initially talked about things like holidays and the sort of things that blogs were well known for right at the beginning, but have since sort of faded away from that, at least in academia. And as the blogs moved on, so has he in that respect. And he now more focuses on mulling over future direction in digital history and considers it a place for sort of random thinking pieces. Um, a fun place to write and think rather than sort of anything that's too strict and formal. Um, he, he did also say that it was really good for putting prose or for writing random thoughts into prose and uh, Miriam Dobson also mentioned this that sometimes you have a bit of research done or you've got picked up a little thread but there's no time at, the, at that present time to actually really go with it. So this is a way to write down 500 words of prose trying to put this, these thoughts and ideas down in some kind of form that makes sense. You put it on the blog, it's there as a blog post and it's there as a frozen moment in time of your thought and you can come back to it later when you actually do have time to look at it and then continue from there. Um, it's, I mean it's a practice that historians do anyway just by keeping it in a Word document or something like that on their computer but it's another way of actually doing that and to make something more of it. Um, how, did, how was the blog managed? Um, Tim Hitchcock's exact words were chaotic and undirected, so that's not my words whatsoever. Um, basically, he doesn't have any plan, there's no schedule, no thought really behind it, other than if he has something that doesn't have any other use or purpose, it'll probably go up on the blog. Um, or the, the, if there's something specifically that's useful to go up on the blog, he will put it there. So the, there's a lot less thought in it in his case. 
Um, I don't necessarily think that this is the case with most people who do personal research blogs. I think more pe most people are actually a bit more concerned with using it in a slightly different way than this. But it was, it's quite interesting to hear that for him, it was just it was enough, just one among many sort of avenues for them um, sort of pushing putting things out there. Finally, on to the early modern commons, which was the blog aggregator. Um, questions were slightly different for this. Um, it was set up to be a kind of blog role plus. So in the early days of blogs, you'd get a long list of ba basically blogs that that person likes, um, just a long list of it. And so Sharon wanted to do something a little bit more of that um, to make a useful blog role, basically. So as I said um, earlier, it covers about 260 early modern blogs. You can either submit your blog yourself um, for a system that she's got set up, or she will search, she occasionally searches them out and adds them. And it covers everything from sort of academics to um, sort of reenactment, um, literature, and all sorts of things. Um, but there is a, a rough, you know, if it's complete rubbish, it won't go on there. But the majority of things will be allowed. Um, when I was talking to her, it, it does seem that one of the problems with blogs is there's so many out there, you can't find them necessarily. And this is one way that's one way forward on that is to actually aggregate those in some form. Um, so I really like this idea, and I, I found this was quite an interesting project that she's got set up there. Um, other questions I asked, if I move on, um, about audience. Nobody seemed to know what their audience was. Statistics wasn't really giving them enough details on this. They all suspected that, in the case of academics, that it was other academics that were reading their posts mainly. And in the case of our, and the library and archives and, and probably history matters as well, that there's a bit more of a divide between the sort of interested, um, interested public, um, sort of those who might read history today and so forth, as well as the academics. So there's a bit more of a, a mix between the two sort of different types there. For feedback, um, as I said, most bloggers didn't find that people commented on the blog at all, really. Um, you'd get occasional ones. I think Tim Hitchcock said sort of good post mate is what he generally gets um, on his posts. But the Russian history blog I said was a different example. So when it works as a research blog amongst people, it can actually bring comments in. But you can't necessarily expect that to be the case. It's, it's almost, um, it will either happen or it won't. But one thing that was picked up a few times was that Twitter quite often brought up more feedback. So it's actually, if you connect your blog to the Twitter post and talk about it there, there's a chance that you'll get a bit more feedback through that sort of mechanism. So there's a different way to actually pick up some stuff. Um, promotion of the blog, they basically use social media. They use Twitter and Facebook sometimes. They quite often put it as an email signature at the base of the post, um, mention it at conference talks, and um, I think in at least one case there was an EU newsletter that it's all, always posted onto. Okay, so. On this section, finally, I'll just show you a video with, about best practice. Um, it's basically a collection of some of the audio worms for reduced down in size, so hopefully this will work. So I'll let them basically speak for this section. It's not going to work. I've got the video anyway. Right, here we go. Uh, enthusiasm on the part of the blogger. They have to want to write whatever they're writing um, and they have to want to share something. Um, and we're very lucky in that everyone on the blog has volunteered. Everyone wants to be doing it. Um, most of the time they're, they're asking for more ways to contribute as well. Okay. Um, and yeah, and sort of that sort of passion, enthusiasm, and expertise because they are all experts in their own particular area that really comes through. I think it's got to be entertaining. You aren't expecting people to um, have to make the effort to read it. It should, it should just flow. It should be a, a nice, snappy piece. So it should be clear and concisely written, not in the style of a scholarly article with tons of footnotes because we have had things people can't snap out of the way of writing for scholarly journals and you have to try and nudge them into something quite different. It's, it's quite a challenge. Um, I like people writing short sentences. Three to five hundred words maximum we've set. If it's anything 
longer than about seven or eight hundred words people tend to switch off because it looks too long on the page if it is presented in very long blocks of text uh, then it, people again tend to your bounce rate gets very high because um, people get intimidated by those things on a screen the number of words looks more for some reason it's just a sort of mental thing about reading on a screen okay so that's just a few of the sort of highlights basically Okay, um, moving on um, briefly to the survey, um, this part of the project really didn't go as well. Um, there was about um, 139 responses, very little from the archives and library sector in that as well. It's mainly academics, I think, and postgraduates that replied to this. So this part of it went down slightly less, less it was less useful than I'd hoped. Um, but what I did get from it was that 92% of, um, of those participants said that they blogged as an individual rather than in collaboration with colleagues. Um, I, I guess that explains the, sort of the solar nature of, the, of um, history in general. Um, but I'll just quickly go through a few of those survey results. Um, one of the questions asked is, in any given week, approximately how many blogs, history-related blogs do you visit? Um, it was quite scattered between sort of a couple of times to over 20 each week. There was, there was more people that only visit a few, but it didn't really mean too much. It was quite that people there's lots or there's little, and it didn't really make much difference. I wanted to know a little bit about how they were accessing blogs as well, um, which is beginning to be more of an important um, thing, I think. Um, majority are still web browsers, but sort of some kind of RSS reader was talked about, um, tablet, um, an iPad, or smartphone is also becoming quite a bit popular there. Um, so I'd like to know a little bit more about that, if, there's sort of, if there is an increase in tablets and smartphones, which I suspect there are in reading these blog posts. Um, what additional features do you think make for a good blog? So the extra widgets and so forth that you appear on there. Twitter feeds and categories were the most popular, so promotion of the blog so you can find out that what posts are going up. And categories allows you to sort of investigate the blog in different ways under certain topics. Um, a list of past posts was also quite popular and an option to follow the blog, so again to be able to sort of follow what's actually happening. They were the main things that people sort of wanted. Um, as I said, writing as an individual was the most popular, but what was interesting is that those who collaborated on blogs did so pretty much equally between those who were within a single institution and those across institutions. Um, if that is any way similar in sort of a wider context, then perhaps that does suggest that there is a beginning of a shift sort of between, or, or on the collaborative blogging, between research type blogs, between those with similar interests and the institution itself. So I'd be interested to know more on that. Um, Okay, so that's basically the survey. As I say, that the results don't really bear out much that's actually useful. It needs a sort of a high amount of people, really. Um, but onto the future slightly. The toolkit that I mentioned at the beginning is pretty much ready. It's actually sitting on my hard drive right now in a draft form um, and will be going up hopefully in the next couple of weeks. What I hope to do with that is to set it up as almost like an FAQ type of thing. Um, going through various different categories, which you can see here. So the use of blogs for historians, setting up a blog, promoting your blog, um, a bit about shared blogging, creating content, um, enhanced features, and sort of further reading and so forth. So they're the basic categories that I'll be um, sort of talking about. And there'll be sort of short paragraphs for each of those with a few podcasts and videos sort of put into there where relevant. Um, so break, this is just a breakdown of those sections of the toolkit. So um, for the first first section, for example, it'd be sort of asking questions of why you might want to do this, what what's the relevance of this for me, um, and what are the risks potentially. And then, yeah, there's, there's the rest of them there. And finally, an example of what sort of content will be in there. So in this case, it's the choosing a blog platform. What I've done is there's a brief blurb at the beginning and then it, a bit of a breakdown of all the main types of um, blog platforms that you get, so WordPress, Blogger, Typeset and so forth, so that I'll just a sort of brief bit of information about them to make it easier to make a decision on what type of blog might be useful to you, basically. Um, leading on to the conclusions from this, I think if you want to start a blog, you need to think seriously right from the start. You want to know 
what the blog is about, what you want to get out of the blog, and what title that you will have for that. And these are all things that you need to consider before you even really start setting anything up. Despite common wisdom, it's not necessarily um, useful to regularly blog post. Um, Tim Hitchcock, admittedly, is a well-known historian in his field, so he gets lots of hits anyway. But he only posts every now and then, and people still come to it when a new post comes up. It's not necessary, unless you're really wanting to get an established audience that will constantly visit your blog, it's not necessary that you need to regularly post. It will be picked up by those who are actually interested in what you're talking about generally, especially if you advertise for other means like Twitter. Um, also, most people suggest under a thousand words for each post, but again, that's not a rule that you have to necessarily stick to. You can have it longer or shorter, um, as you saw in the um, um, short-term video there. Um, one person said about 500, no more. Another was sort of more towards 700, so it does vary. Um, consider shared blog. It's uh, shared blogging. It's actually a, a quite a constructive way to do it, and offers quite a few opportunities in itself. And it can be quite a fun process. So it's worth considering if you can get involved in a shared blog to do so. Um, but individual blogging is good as well. You just need to have a plan and a bit of thought behind it. Don't don't just sort of even though the technical side is easy to do. Maintaining the content and making it useful for you and your own research is actually quite important. Um, one of the things, there's a few things I want to do to take this project further. I want to create a few more short clips from the podcast that I've got, um, like the one I showed you, and um, just sort of cutting it down to a particular question and seeing what people have said on that and bringing them down to about sort of a couple of minutes long and posting those on YouTube as well as the blog and elsewhere. So that's one thing I want to actually do, is sort of do a bit more editing on those. Second, I want to do more interviews, but this time in a kind of text format. So I want to send out to particular bloggers five or six questions and ask them if they would mind sort of filling in a paragraph or so about each, and then I, that could be posted onto the blog. So I want to sort of form a bit more of a collection of what people already in the field are doing with blogs, and hopefully that will be of sort of use to people. Um, when they start out on blogs and what they might want to do from it. Um, and that's about it, really. So thank you for listening, and I'll answer any questions you like. <laughs>